Now, please welcome your host for today's webinar, Marlies Perez. Thank you so much and welcome everybody to our Behavioral Health Transformation Public Listening Session. And today our topic is Housing Interventions under the Behavioral Health Services Act. My name is Marlise Perez. I am with the Department of Healthcare Services and I am the Behavioral Health Transformation Project Executive. And we can move to our next slide. And so, um, as was already mentioned, we are recording this event. So if you are listening based on the recording, hello. Um, we do also have live captioning available. So um, that is available and tech support as well. So feel free, um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, to receive some tech support. Next slide. Um, so just as a reminder, um, we really, want everybody to participate and how you can do so um, is by dropping in um, your feedback into the Q&A. And so um, I'm gonna have questions for you throughout the session. Um, so really encourage you to put that feedback in. We are collecting all of the feedback and um, we then post that um, a few weeks after on our website, um, just kind of a summary of the feedback that we're receiving today. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned already, um, please give us your feedback. Um, you are also going to have um, the availability if you want to, after the listening session, provide us feedback. Um, I'll wrap back at the end of the presentation uh, for the due date on when we'd like to have that feedback from you. Next slide. Uh, so it, I'm already here. Uh, the date we'd like to have that feedback is September 19th. Um, and if you could just email our BHT info uh, email, that would be awesome. And um, we'll then take your feedback and make sure that we incorporate it with the feedback that we received today. Now, if you have feedback after the 19th, feel free to still send it um, to this email. It won't make it into the, the document, but we will be seeing that at DHCS. All right, so um, our topic today is really around uh, the Behavioral Health Services Act and how the bucket around housing interventions um, can be utilized um, across um, this effort. However, first, just really want to acknowledge there has been really unprecedented investments in California in housing and just really wanted to highlight some of those investments that have been overseen by us here at DHCS. And so the first one is our Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Program. Um, we've also had new behavioral health issues under our CalAIM program, including community supports and transitional rent. And then, of course, um, what we'll be talking about mostly today around BHSA and housing interventions. So as we move to our next slide, I um, just really want to highlight here, um, this is the entire funding for the Behavioral Health Services Act. And you'll see here on the left side of your screen, under that 90% um, of funding that goes to our county partners, 30% um, is for housing interventions. And um, of course, this is done through their local planning process and these decisions are made by the locals. Um, however, we at the state um, set that policy um, in order for them to adhere to the statutory requirements. Next slide. And so with this bucket of funding, this 30% um, for housing interventions, um, there are a few requirements that the statute lays out. And so in that here of this 30%, you'll see here that at least 50% of this funding must be used for persons who are chronically homeless. And this is with a focus of individuals living in encampments. And then there is also an allowance of up to 25% of these funds that can be used for capital development projects. It's not required, um, it is an allowance. Um, there are also some exemptions to these requirements that are outlined in statute. And for our, our counties uh, have a population of less than 200,000, they can request an exemption in their first integrated plan process, um, which is for 2026 through 2029. Um, 
they'll be able to have that opportunity. And then for our larger counties, um, they'll have that availability in future years as outlined in statutes. Um, and then also counties have the flexibility to move up to 7% of funds either into or out of the housing interventions uh, category, and they can shift those funds either into our full service partnership or our behavioral health services and supports or shift from those buckets into this bucket as well. Next slide. And so in this bucket of funding, this 30% around housing interventions, um, the activities that are allowable include rental subsidies, operating subsidies, uh, shared housing, which includes recovery housing, family housing, uh, the non-federal share for transitional rent, other housing supports, um, and like I already mentioned, the capital development projects, and then project-based housing assistance, including master leasing. Next slide. So this is really important, uh, the target population for housing interventions. Um, first and foremost, even before um, this definition is met, individuals must meet the definitions for the Behavioral Health Services Act, um, that they have the eligibility, so they need to meet those definitions um, around having um, severe mental illness and, and other um, SUD. Uh, so just to be clear, you have to have that in order to get in the front door of BHSA. But then for this bucket of funding of housing interventions, um, they must meet these um, qualifications. And the, so the first is for eligible children and youth. Um, you'll see here, this is one, um, they have to meet one of these requirements in order to be eligible for housing interventions. And then as we move to the next slide, um, for adults, um, they have to uh, meet one of these definitions. And of course, they also need to um, be in need of the housing services. And as it's mentioned earlier, um, there's a, a definition around that piece as well. Next slide. And so as we are designing the policy um, at DHCS, just some of the principles um, that we are utilizing as our guardrails in this space is that the overall goal is obviously to reduce homelessness. Um, and this is reducing homelessness for individuals that are experiencing a behavioral health condition. Um, once again, with a focus on those chronically homeless. Um, but these housing interventions really must include access to clinical and supportive behavioral health services. This isn't just standalone housing. Um, the individuals need to have low barrier um, services that utilize harm reduction strategies and also housing first principles. Um, and they may include uh, recovery residences. Um, another um, part of our design principle is really to increase the number of available housing settings. Uh, but once again, these housing settings for individuals with behavioral health needs, um, we recognize that they, individuals with behavioral health conditions have higher housing needs um, than those individuals that don't have uh, behavioral health conditions. Next slide. Uh, we also really want to ensure that there's flexibility for counties. Um, we recognize there's different needs um, at the county level. Uh, once again, as I mentioned, this is a part of the local planning process. I mean, counties will decide how to utilize their funding for the housing intervention bucket um, based on that local need. Uh, we also really want to make sure that we're building out from what we've already provided under the Mental Health Services Act. Um, also with our Behavioral Health Bridge Housing Program um, and with our partners at HomeKey, and then all of the other work that we've already done in California in this space. And then we also lastly want to ensure that we are really maximizing other available resources, and that includes what's available under our Medi-Cal program, uh, but also HUD housing vent, uh, vouchers as well. Um, so really want to talk about housing first. Um, so, you know, this is a, a work uh, that has been rolled out in California around housing first. Um, and we just want to emphasize that these housing intervention settings need to be low barrier, utilize harm reduction strategies, and the housing first principles. And so um, 
just really wanted to highlight around housing first, um, that they need to comply with that, but recognize um, that that can include recovery housing, um, which is a really important um, housing component, especially for individuals that have a substance use disorder. Um, and then also just consistent with HUD and the Cal ICH guidance, um, this compliance with Housing First is really going to be assessed through a holistic approach, um, ensuring that each county's housing intervention program in total is representing um, these core components. Next slide. And so um, in looking at these housing interventions, really want to just talk about the allowable settings that we're considering. Um, and so for these settings, um, we're looking at these being allowable and without time limits. Um, in, and these are the permanent settings that we're looking at. Apartments, supportive housing, master lease apartments, single room occupancy, shared housing, recovery housing, and then assisted living, um, which could be adult residential care facilities, residential care facilities for the elderly, and unlicensed board and care patches. Next slide. Also, um, as outlined in the statute, is funding can be used for the share of transitional rent. So transitional rent um, is a benefit that DHCS is in the process of rolling out. Um, we recently received um, rolled out some guidance. If you haven't seen it, um, we you know, really encourage you to look at that. We have the link here. Um, but for, as this pertains to the housing intervention bucket, um, we are requiring that individuals that have Medi-Cal or Medi-Cal members, um, they are to be utilizing this transitional rent benefit, and it is a six-month benefit. Um, but if that individual has utilized that benefit, and they meet the eligibility requirements of BHSA, meaning that they have a behavioral health condition um, that they could utilize, then counties could utilize and provide an additional six months of coverage um, in these interim settings. And so, and then for those individuals that do not qualify for the transitional rent benefit, um, these ho housing intervention funds could provide um, up to 12 months of coverage in the same interim settings under that are already covered under our Medi-Cal transitional rent benefit. Next slide. So this is your time right here. So it's one of your first questions here. And we'd love to hear from you. So if you could put your responses in the Q&A and I'm just gonna go through and read some of them. I do just wanna state, I'm not gonna get to everybody's because we tend to get a lot of feedback, which is excellent, but we are capturing all of it. So your first question is, what feedback do you have on the proposed allowable BHSA housing settings? So just wanna open that up. And maybe as you're thinking about that response, if my team could just pull us back to that slide that has the proposed allowable BHSA setting so folks can see, see that list, that'd be great. Um, so I'm going to start looking at some of these responses. One of my team members, um, Alana Rube, is also going to be chiming in and just reading out some of these. Um, so these, once again, are the proposed um, allowing uh, allowable um, settings. So please would love to hear your feedback on, do you agree with these? Do you feel any are missing? I see some comments emphasizing the need for the permanent supportive housing and to um, expand upon that. It looks like um, some comments in here about adult residential facilities. And so um, that is here. Um, 
on that list. Um, probably that comment came in maybe perhaps before we were sharing the slide there. Oh, so we don't have the right slide up. Can we move to the um, allowable settings slide? There we go. Sorry about that. So yeah, so here is the um, adult residential facilities that that commenter put in. Okay, well, we are not receiving too much feedback yet, but feel free um, now that this um, slide is up, you know, if you have additional feedback um, throughout the presentation, you're more than welcome to drop that in the Q&A. Um, we'd love to hear that. And once again, really looking at um, if there's any, do you agree with this list or are there any housing settings um, that you feel should be included? And once again, this is only for permanent settings. This is not... Um, around the interim settings. Those interim settings um, will be um, defined, um, but this is once again, just for the permanent settings. And this is the settings that we're proposing to have allowable without time limits. Okay, so if we can move forward, um, if my team could move us forward, that'd be great. Okay, so um, what we wanna go into next is um, around, um, so we've talked a little bit about the settings that we're looking at and the transitional rent, um, but now we want to move into operating subsidies. So this is another, you'll see here on the right, this is the list of all the specifications um, in the statute. So just really want to talk about what we're considering to be allowable under operating subsidies. And so um, this is really modified. We um, utilized um, the HUD guidance in this space and really looking at, you'll see kind of our laundry list here of what some of these operating costs may include, utilities, maintenance and repairs. Um, some of the things I think all of our folks out in the housing world are very um, familiar with. Um, and then of course, um, just wanting to highlight um, these operating subsidy costs also that are not covered by our managed care plans. Next slide. Um, also, what we want to highlight next is around the rental subsidies programs. Um, so what we are considering is that this could be established through master leasing, um, whether that be scattered site or doing project-based housing. And then with our bridge housing program that we've been rolling out at DHCS over the last few years, um, we also want to um, look at having long-term rental assistance um, and have that be allowable under BHSA. And then for this rental assistance, um, that length of time would be at the discretion of the county. Um, and uh, so that would really be, once again, um, also based on the needs of the individual. Next slide. Um, so another area here you'll see that we just um, want to provide some guidance is um, around community sports. Now, once again, these would need to be housing related. Um, and so, of course, if this is a Medi-Cal member, they would need to be utilizing uh, the community sports benefit that is offered under our Medi-Cal managed care plans. Um, but if they've already reached that limit um, of what can be provided um, or for individuals that aren't eligible for Medi-Cal, um, this BHSA funding could be utilized um, for these services. And some of these that we're considering are housing transition navigation services, housing deposits, housing tenancy and sustaining services, uh, short-term post-hospitalization housing, and then recuperative care. Uh, next slide. So um, do you have feedback on the proposed guidance around the operating subsidies, the rental subsidies, or community supports? And so I think what would be great is um, maybe what we can do for my team is just bump back to the community supports, and then we'll kind of shift through all three of these slides so folks can just see that. Um, and then if you could pop in some comments um, into the Q&A, um, that would be really great. And um, just as a note, I have seen some questions in the Q&A. We will be posting this slide deck as well um, on our website. So opening up once again, if you have any comments around um, what we are 
proposing around the community supports, um, the rental subsidies, um, and that'd be great. Um, it looks like we have some comments um, that a long-term operating subsidy is the most valuable to develop permanent supportive housing. Um, also, um, they're very, very supportive of community supports that could take the form of on-site service, service commitments for permanent supportive housing units. Um, also, for permanent supportive housing sites that are currently operated by our county, having operating subsidies that are a general subsidy as opposed to being a subsidy tied to a unit would be hugely helpful. Um, looks like um, someone stated that they have some good coverage across um, all three of these, but they also recommend DHCS to enforce close collaboration, excuse me, close coordination with county departments and the managed care plans to improve um, coordination and reduce administrative duplication and barriers. Um, also, um, someone here agrees that the long-term subsidies are the highest priority for permanent supportive housing. I'm seeing that agreement on a few different comments here. Also, um, on agreement with on-site wraparound supportive services. I'm also seeing a comment just emphasizing the importance for coordination among these services and um, the flexibility of the time frame looks like it'll be very valuable for counties. Great. Um, also seeing a lot of comments around, once again, the long-term operating subsidies and how important they are. Great. And there's also a lot of questions we're receiving in the chat. Um, we are not at this time answering the questions because right now we're just proposing some of our policy guidance. However, um, once our policy guidance is released, um, we will definitely be also hosting a lot of technical assistance, FAQs, and all the traditional things um, you know, that we have available um, as we roll out and implement um, BHSA. So. And with that, I am going to move us forward because we have so much um, to get through and also a lot more questions for you. So if we could um, move forward to our next slide. Okay, so it looks like now um, we just want to highlight what we are considering around other housing supports. Um, so this is, um, once again, if these are not available as a community support, uh, but having participant assistance funds. Um, so once again, if there are barriers to um, individuals um, receiving, you know, their immediate housing needs, um, that this could be allowable. And then also landlord mitigation funds. Um, and once again, this is to really encourage um, and increase the housing availability for the individuals that we're serving. Next slide. 
Um, other housing supports, um, these are actually my absolute favorite, um, but these are addressing the three P's. And this is around um, partners, um, once again, in that shared housing or family housing. Um, and so all these housing interventions would be allowable for shared and family housing. Um, once again, this also would include recovery housing. Um, pets, um, so reasonable accommodations and assistance animals, um, different models of co-sheltering, um, addressing the animal behavior concerns, supplies, um, and then animal um, welfare partners, having that identification, and then also possessions, um, storage accommodations, deposits, um, fees, items like that. Um, next, really just want to move into um, a discussion around permanent supportive housing. Um, so the permanent supportive housing needs to be implemented in line with HUD guidance. Um, and so once again, these settings may be funded through rental subsidies and operating subsidies. Um, so with rental subsidies, this could be, as I mentioned earlier, either a scattered site, which could be multiple locations or project-based. Um, and that could just obviously be one location, um, but it can also um, include master leasing. And then as we discuss operating subsidies um, could cover housing related supports um, as we've kind of already walked through um, some examples around the participant um, assistant funds, um, other resources such as that. However, um, this is really important. All of these settings must identify access to behavioral health services, um, and they must accommodate for medication-assisted treatment. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with medication-assisted treatment, this is evidence-based, um, and it is medications for individuals with an opioid use disorder. Um, so those must be um, allowable in the housing setting. Next slide. So um, what feedback do you have on the proposed other housing supports or permanent supportive housing? So if my team could just kind of move us and toggle us between those two slides, and then if um, we could get you to provide some feedback in the Q&A, that'd be great. I'm already seeing out um, that somebody loves that medication assisted treatment will be allowed and that behavioral health services are a requirement. Um, someone here is um, stating that it would be great if permanent supportive housing um, could not only identify the access to the behavioral health services, but in some cases actually provide the behavioral health so, um, services. Um, sh shared housing should be at the choice of the tenants, including choice of whether to share or who to live with. Also seeing some comments around allowability for staff time to coordinate and administer all the various housing interventions. Also identifying um, some call outs for additional technical assistance that people are, are requesting related to some of these areas for further clarification. Um, also, just to call out that um, that while the housing settings need to um, offer behavioral health services and MAT, that it is voluntary for the the individuals to choose to receive those services. I am seeing some feedback too around, and just as a clarification, um, these behavioral health services would not be funded under the housing intervention bucket. Um, the housing intervention bucket would just be for the housing interventions that we're going over today, not for the, the behavioral health services, but those could be funded either through Medi-Cal or other parts of BHSA.
Also see um, folks appreciate that funds could be used to offset damages. There's a significant need. Also, this um, same support for the pet supports as well. Just a lot of comments about the access to behavioral health services um, must be identified. Very important for resident success, but I'm seeing that quite a bit throughout the comments. Um, let's see here. There's a comment to add eligible use to develop and manage centralized landlord engagement programs versus just mitigation. Um, also, homelessness prevention funding should also be called out. Um, and so feel free um, to keep putting in your responses, um, but I am going to move us forward on the next slides, please. So um, next thing in the statute uh, requires DHCS um, to, uh, well, first of all, the Welfare and Institution Codes identifies the definition um, for chronically homeless, but it does give DHCS the discretion to modify the definition. So DHCS has identified areas um, where we are considering minor modifications. Um, and the first area is to eliminate the requirement of at least four occasions of homelessness for individuals who qualify based on the 12 discontinuous months of homelessness over the past three years. And then consistent with our definition of homeless under our Medi-Cal community supports and also our BH Connect and also our Behavioral Health Bridge Housing, all three of our programs modify the requirement that a person who otherwise meets the requirements for chronically homeless and is transitioning out of institutional or carceral settings has resided there for fewer than 90 days. Um, so those are the modifications that we are looking um, at proceeding with um, for the federal definition of chronically homeless. And so here, um, these are also, um, this is here outlines the definition that we are looking at for chronically homeless here. Um, and you'll see um, that has been incorporated um, in our proposed de definition. So this is what we're looking at. The areas in bold, as I just mentioned, are the two areas that we're looking at modifying um, for the definition of chronically homeless. Next slide. Um, so with this definition around chronically homeless, um, once again, the individual must meet the basic BHSA eligibility requirements. Um, and then also, if a county is transferring fundi funding into or out of this 30% housing interventions bucket, um, that percentage of serving the chronically homeless, so let's say a county adds 5% into their bucket, um, and now they have 35% of funds for housing interventions, 50% of that um, 35% needs to be utilized for the chronically homeless population. And so um, for that purpose of what does it mean to, you know, for that determination of chronically homeless, um, so that would be made at the period of enrollment, um, and that would not be reassessed for the duration of their participation. And then also, if a capital development project, um, as I mentioned earlier, counties can use up to 25% for capital development at their choice and, um, you know, after working with their local stakeholders, um, that capital development project, if it is to be serving the chronically homeless population, that also counts um, toward that 50% requirement. 
And then once again, um, for that local planning process, because counties will be responsible for putting together an integrated plan and providing it to DHCS, um, individuals in encampments are expected to be prioritized uh, for utilizing this housing intervention funding. Um, once again, in alignment um, with this other guidance as stated here. Next slide. So um, what feedback do you have on the proposed definitions and policy clarifications of experiencing homelessness or at risk and chronically homeless? So once again, we'll just move kind of slowly back through some of these slides um, and would love some of your feedback. I see one comment saying that they agree with eliminating the timeline limitations around institutional settings as several state programs have also eliminated this restriction. Um, also see agreement with eliminating uh, the timeline limitations around the institutional settings. More of that, more, more comments around that, as Alana mentioned. Just some comments here about to just ensure that this um, modified definition does not cause issues in the braiding of HUD and BHSA funding and projects, um, and to engage HUD um, to commit to accepting modified definition in housing, also funded with HUD dollars. Uh, some comments here, this individual disagrees with the change of the at least four occasions of homelessness um, as having a different definition than HUD will make pairing these resources with others more difficult. Um, including uh, community supports and ECM. I do just want to state our definition does align um, with all of our, our programs under DHCS. I also highlight a comment um, that says that it's good to think about how this is connected to homeless youth identified via their school districts as the federal definition for homeless is a little different than the HUD definition. Again. So some comments, um, good modifications. Um, also a comment, how can we change the situation that formerly incarcerated are not considered homeless when they absolutely are? In other words, not limit to the 90 days. As someone here states 12 months is too long. Removing the requirement for four episodes of homelessness will allow for more people in need to qualify and obtain permanent housing. Some comments here, I'm concerned about the chronically homeless 50% requirement. Will there be waivers for this requirement? Um, I do just wanna state, um, as I, I mentioned earlier in the slide deck, um, you might not have caught it, there is a waiver for our counties of populations 200,000 or less um, for their first integrated plan. And then statute um, allows um, an exemption request for larger counties um, in subsequent years. Um, and with that, I'm just going to um, move on here from now. But once again, please feel free to keep um, putting your feedback into um, the Q&A. Um, so next, I want to move into, I've been talking about that allowance of up to 25% for capital development. And so once again, this is um, not required. Um, this is something that the counties may choose to do. 
Um, and so with that, if counties choose to utilize um, some funding um, for capital development, um, it does need to be available within a reasonable timeline. Um, and this will be determined through the local planning process. Um, and then in the integrated plan that I've been talking about that counties submit to us um, every three years, um, this the counties would need to describe that to us and then that would uh, be subject to DHCS approval. And then for those of you um, that aren't aware of how um, this funding works, there are reversion requirements. If funding is not spent uh, within specified time periods, um, those um, timelines would apply to this funding as well. Um, another requirement outlined in statute is that these units would need to make, meet a cost per unit threshold, um, which would be set by DHCS. Um, right now, we are looking at um, a cost per unit at around $115,000 um, with an annual increase for inflation. Um, right now, our MHSA cost per unit is a little over $100,000, and then our bridge housing is about 75,000, however, we found that to be pretty low. Um, but then of course, counties could add funding from additional um, sources for their capital improvement projects. Next slide. Um, so then for the capital development, um, we would allow counties to accrue um, their funding over multiple years. Um, once again, though, the, the funds would be subject to reversion if not spent by the county um, during their authorized time period, which is within three years or five years. Um, but we will be providing clarification in our policy manual um, as to what we consider spent mean um, for the purposes of reversion and for capital um, infrastructure. And I do just want to state really quickly, um, DHCS is aiming to have our policy guidance out um, in early 2025. Um, that will include our housing intervention um, guidance. Um, we will be releasing our guidance in modulars um, through the course of 2025. But in early 2025, we'll be releasing the guidance that counties will need in order to begin planning out for their integrated plan. So once again, housing interventions will be a part of that. Um, and so look out for that because um, we will be also looking for um, comments on that guidance before it is final. Next slide. So do you have any feedback on the proposed guidance on the capital infrastructure portion of the housing intervention? So just wanna open that up. If our team could just move back a few slides, that'd be great. Uh, one here is um, the dollar figures. I think they're talking about the cost per unit um, don't align with current costs. No place like home has some figures on how much it has practically costed in recent years and the services amounts probably could come from counties. Also, um, a comment, please address for capital development if there are any stacking limitations with other state funding. Um, this 115K limit per unit is not enough to fully fund a unit with current costs. Uh, the maximum cost per unit for BHSA funding seems extremely low. Um, though the MHSA cost per unit was low, the cost of developing housing well exceeds inflation. Looks like some requests to lift the exemption rule from populations 200,000 to 300,000. Um, I do have to state we don't have that authority because that is um, in the statute. Just more more comments around the cost per unit um, being relatively low. So 
Awesome. I'm going to keep moving us forward. So if we can move to the, the next slides. Um, next, we really want to talk about um, flexible housing subsidy pools. And so um, with as much as potentially a billion dollars in ongoing BHSA housing intervention funding and recognizing that will fluctuate um, since this is a taxed um, based uh, revenue, um, but really recognizing that not only is there housing funding available through uh, BHSA, but also our other initiatives such as Cal AIM, Transitional Rent, um, but there's a lot of local resources that are available for housing. And so um, what the administration is doing is really um, doing some work around uh, flexible housing subsidy pools. Um, we recognize that there are some counties that have already implemented flexible housing subsidy pools at the local level, um, and that there are a lot of great benefits um, to having flex pools. And so really what a flex pool is, is just it's a model for having the pooling of funding available um, that could then be um, coordinated and administrated um, for rental subsidies and housing supports. And so, um, you know, there's really a lot of great ways that barriers can be reduced. Um, there's a lot of solutions that flex pools can bring forward um, to braid together um, these available resources. And then, of course, with our additions of transitional rent at DHCS under CalAIM um, and the housing intervention buckets, it could be a model that counties can utilize um, that really meet the needs uh, of our behavioral health members. And then also other resources could be utilized. Um, there's lots of different um, ways that this can be initiated at the local level. Next slide. And so really what it is, is um, these are, you know, the, the flex pools that are already in place in California, um, all are look a little bit different, but it could be rental unit identification, streamlining access um, to enter into housing, um, the provision of tenancy supports, housing navigation, other available services. Um, once again, really serving to help braid the funding, but on the back end, um, and then really to be able to leverage other resources such as HUD vouchers, local subsidies, and other things that are available in the community to really maximize what's available in this space um, for housing. And so there is some information. And if you're interested in learning more about it, we have a link here. Um, and then as we move to our next slide, I um, just really want to state that we recommend at DHCS that our managed care plan partners, county behavioral health agencies, and other implementation partners really consider implementing flex pools um, at the local level. And, you know, with BHSA, it really provides another opportunity for coordination uh, between our behavioral health partners and our managed care plans um, and other existing housing systems to really coordinate together. Um, and we feel like these flexible housing subsidy pools are another lever um, that could really assist in this effort. And so we're really looking right now at DHCS, how we can provide technical assistance and support um, to really develop resources to promote how to stand up flex pool models. Um, and so once again, we're looking at developing guidance around it, toolkits, um, things that can assist um, our counties and, and other partners to identify like, how would it work? Whose role? How, how would all of this actually play out? Um, and once again, um, having lots of technical assistance, um, hosting convenings and other efforts like that to really help utilize this model um, in California. Next slide. So this is just a little picture here of how a local um, flex pool um, could look. Oops, we moved pretty fast off that picture. <laughs> But anyway, it really is just a depiction um, of how this all comes together to really provide that um, supportive housing for the individuals that we're serving in California. And you can move us to the next slide. And so really just want to um, close out on the flex pool that we really see um, the benefits that could be ensuring centralized deployment 
um, of housing, once again, the location, the navigation, and the rental subsidy payments, um, but really helps continue to build out uh, relationships within the county and potentially across the region, depending on how these are set up to really leverage the resources that are available. Um, and, you know, we have this siloed funding um, in these various buckets, and, and this is a way to really bring it all together. Um, it could also potentially be a way to leverage other funding, whether it's philanthropic or other local state and federal funds in a quicker manner. Next slide. So um, do you have any feedback on the proposed guidance or the concept around flex pools? And so going to open that up and if my team could kind of just slowly move us back through some of the slides. Um, one question I see is, um, could you provide examples of jurisdictions that have flexible housing subsidy pools? Um, I can, I just know off the top of my head, um, Los Angeles County has um, flex pools and Imperial County. Um, Let's see, flex pools can also be structured as long-term operating and services subsidies for up to 20 years. It is important to have this long-term commitment in order to leverage other funding for permanent supportive housing from public and private sources, such as permanent mortgages and tax credit equity. I see someone commenting that they've used flexible subsidies to deliver housing services and are supportive of this idea. Uh, somebody here is really excited and happy to see flex pools. <laughs> Again, very supportive on flex pools. <sighs> uh, let's see. Agree with your ideas for flex pools. Is it possible for the state to work with uh, philanthropy to seed the flex pools across the state? We've seen this as the typical model in jurisdictions with flex pools. Also here suggest that DHCS makes flex pools optional. Just to be really clear, these would be optional. This is not a mandate under BHSA. You know that it is important to keep flex, flex, as flexible as possible to support different housing settings, services, and navigation. Um, let's see here. I would suggest providing TA on flex pools. A lot of counties are voicing concern and confusion of how this would work, which we definitely um, is our intent um, to provide this technical assistance. Appreciate the focus on flex pools and really have close coordination with the transitional rent from the managed care plans will be critical. Oh, Sacramento County has flex pools. And someone commenting that San Francisco also has a flex pool. Um, and very supportive of flex pools using BHSA dollars, vital for counties to explore this important model. Um, flex pools are administratively difficult to create, so funding and TA are absolutely needed to create these, especially in smaller counties. Uh, incentivize the flex pool model by saying DHCS will work directly to ensure managed care plans and BHSA funding are used in integrated way within those models. Um, uh, as a county that does not have flex pools, the idea of starting one is daunting. It's hard to know where to start and how to get it started. Where will the seed funding for this come from? Let's see, working sessions with counties to get their questions answered.
also some questions around could counties collaborate to create multi jurisdictional flex pools. A lot of questions on. Oh, sorry, Alana, go right ahead. Just to say that please take into consideration the cost of establishing a flex pool and provide the resources to incentivize implementation. Also seeing a lot of questions on like, how do you actually create one, which is something that we would be assisting with providing technical assistance on. Um, TA to um, tailor to medium and smaller counties on how to start seed fund implement and maintain would be great. Awesome. Um, I think we are almost at a close. So if we could move to, I think we have um, one more slide, I think. Oh, there's our thank you slide. So I do want to thank all of you for participating today. I know it was a lot of comments that we did not um, have an opportunity to read out. We just wanted to give you a flavor um, of what we are hearing um, from you. But of course, please, as I mentioned earlier, feel free to submit any other comments to our BHT um, info mailbox, um, which is also posted on our website. If you don't have that um, available, we will be, um, it's actually right here on the screen if you need to write it down, but it is also on our website. Uh, we will be posting this slide deck um, in, the, in the next few days, but then we'll be following up in the next few weeks of a summary document um, of all the feedback that we've received today. Um, and once again, if you don't make the due date, that's okay. Um, we're still reviewing your feedback. It just won't be in the summary document. And then just to close, just want to remind everybody um, that we are going to be putting our final guidance out um, around housing interventions in early 2025, um, but we will be um, putting out um, some of the draft guidance before then, so you'll have another opportunity and uh, to review. Um, and once again, please feel free um, to reach out with additional feedback um, based on what you've seen today, um, or if you haven't seen something today um, that you want to be providing us feedback on in the housing intervention space, please feel free to do so. So once again, I want to thank you for coming today and um, really appreciate your time. And thank you and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.